Uh, just again, a welcome to all of you who are online and who are on Zoom. Uh, the Lord bless you this morning and may, may his words be the words that I will speak this morning. Question, with all the turmoil around us, why is God not acting on our behalf? That's the question many are asking today, and it's an ancient question, actually, that has been asked over many generations. Is God too busy, perhaps, or is he too distracted? Is he unaware? Is God not able to do something? Uh, the answer uh, given by Prophet Isaiah over 2,700 years ago is relevant for us today. You'll find it uh, in Isaiah chapter 59, and it may be helpful to you to have the text close by because I'll actually reference back to it often. So grab a Bible, open your Bible now, whether you have an Apple, I mean, I'm sorry, a Bible app or a physical Bible, great, whatever works for you is totally fine. But open that to Isaiah chapter 59. And we'll start together, Isaiah chapter 59. You'll notice the chapter uh, of 59, Isaiah 59, starts with the implied question, why is God not acting on our behalf? So verse 1 starts by answering well, here's what verse one says. I'll just read it to you. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. The prophetic poetry that we just read here, this prophetic poetry of Isaiah invites the reader into the rest of the text by appealing to God's nature. Surely God is all powerful. So what's going on? Why is God not acting on our behalf? Now, Isaiah wastes no time and gives the explanation. The people of God were separated from God. The people of God were separated from God. Isolation, right? Here's what verse 2 says. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. God's face was hidden from God's people, and therefore he will not hear. Now, make no mistake, this is important, make no mistake, the order of the sentence matters. It's not that they were hidden from God. He saw them just fine. The reality was that the people of God could not see his face because sins blocked the view. Uh, the result felt like God could not hear them. That was the result. It's like those uh, one-way mirrors. You know what I'm talking about? Those one-way mirrors? Have you seen in the movies, perhaps, when someone is brought to the police station and they are placed in a room with one-way mirror? Those outside of the room can see and hear, but the person who's being detained is completely isolated and not able to see nor hear the others. That's really the main idea being communicated by verse 2. Sin cuts off people from God, which means that they are separated, they're isolated, and can no longer see or hear him. Then Isaiah confronts the people of God, the nation of Israel in this case, right, with their sins, and actually proceeds to make a list of their sins. This is a list of sins, starting in verse 3. Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, that's murder. Your lips have spoken falsely and your tongue mutters wicked things. That's lying and accusing others falsely. Uh, verse four, no one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. Well, that's pretty clear, right? No one is interested in real justice. And when they do cry for justice, the case was not handled with integrity. What did they do? Well, Isaiah tells us, continues in the verse four. They rely on empty arguments. Have you ever heard empty arguments recently? Yeah. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. And then the list continues. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. In other words, they're looking for ways to stick it to the other guy. Now, in the next section, Isaiah uses images that his contemporaries were quite familiar with. Snakes. <laughs> yes, snakes. Now, I know many of you go, oh, snakes. I'm so afraid of snakes. Well, back in the, in the deserts of Israel, there were plenty of poisonous snakes. So Isaiah uses that. And he wrote, 
They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. And when one is broken, another adder is hatched. The adder is another kind of snake, by the way. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin and they are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. So what should we do? What should we do? Well, what... <laughs> What should we add to the list already made, right? Here's the list. Evil deeds, acts of violence, shamelessness towards sinful acts, uh, scheming plans to hurt others. And by the way, notice how often violence and shedding of blood is mentioned. And, and by the way, let me, let me just do a quick tangent here because this is very different than defending the territory from an invading army. That's not what we're talking about here when it says violence and shedding of blood. This is violence within. This is brother against brother. This is family against family. And verse 8 says, the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their path. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks among them will know peace. In other words, Isaiah is quite blunt. Isaiah is blunt. Isaiah put together a long list, right? He, 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 he said, look, it's murder, internal violence, lying, false testimony, no justice, no integrity, empty and senseless arguing, uh, looking to, to stick it to the other guy, planning evil, no shame, enthusiastic pursuit of Evil. Now, when I say, we say evil, what do we mean? It's evil is what is opposite to God's way. It's scheming against others and desire for chaos and disruption. And I suspect, I suspect this is not an exhaustive list. This is not an exhaustive list. Why is God not acting? When sin isolates a person from God, they are cut off from God. When sin isolates a nation from God, that nation is cut off from God. The people of God, the, the nation of Israel in our text, in Isaiah's day, were cut off from seeing and hearing God. God never went away, but their sins cut them off. No wonder they asked the question, where is God? Why doesn't God intervene? Well, quite honestly, they had no idea what God was or was not doing. He was hidden from them. Now, what about us today? What about our context? What about today? Well, in light of this uh, national unrest that we're seeing, and in light of the growing tensions all around us, what is our list? Many of the items that Isaiah's list, on the Isaiah list, can be directly applied to us. Murder. Violence, lying, false testimony in court, no justice, no integrity, empty and senseless arguing, each side looking to stick it to the other side, uh, plain evil, rebellion towards God, no shame, enthusiastic pursuit of anything that is opposite to God's way, scheming against the others, a desire for chaos or disruption, and the list continues on and on and on. It continues with how we deal with the unborn, how we deal with the, the poor, how do we deal with veterans, how we deal with the immigrant, how we deal with corruption. Sin, sin is rampant in our nation. Sin is rampant in our nation. No wonder we feel that God is far away. Our sins have cut us off from seeing God's face and hearing him. Many people don't want to hear him. They say, anything but God, anything but God. And then they cry out, well, where is God? Where is God? But, but many, many don't want an answer. They don't want an answer. See, Isaiah's words are valid today, I believe. And, and he said their, their feet rush into sin. They're, they're swift to shed innocent blood. They, they pursue, they pursue evil schemes and acts of violence mark their ways. By the way, if you, in, in case your mind goes into, into accusation mode towards one political party or another, or one group of people versus another, stop. 
please stop right now. That is not the point. The point is that we as a nation, we as individuals, we have done and continue to do that. The proverbial, the proverbial they, the proverbial they are not the problem. It's we. We have strayed away from God and we are enthusiastically pursuing that which is opposite to God's way. Now you might be thinking like, well, that's not me. I pursue God. Well, you know what? Notice that Isaiah uses inclusive language in that list. Includes us and himself in it. So let me suggest a practical action. Let me suggest a practical action out of this. Write down, just like Isaiah did, write down a list of the ways we, the collective we of our nation, have deviated from what God told us would be the best life possible. And please do not use partisan language. Do not use, that, that, that defeats the purpose. That defeats the purpose, the we. Make a list and let the gravity of the situation, let the gra gravity and the situ the, of, of, of sin, let it sink in. Feel the weight. Listen, my friends, we need today to feel the crushing weight of sin. Okay, then what? We just sit under the crushing weight of sin and become crushed? <laughs> become sad? Uh, no, 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 no. Then what? Well, then we move on to the next step. What is the next step? Well, understanding the full weight of the list can leave us paralyzed. Therefore, the list is not the final outcome. The list is not the final outcome. So we need to move on, make the list, but then move on to what? Well, I like what Isaiah did. Uh, starting in verse 9, Isaiah begins to lament. Uh, uh, in verse 9, Isaiah grieves. He grieves the list. Listen to the sadness that just drips from his heart and infuses this prophetic poetry. Verse 9. So justice is far from us. The righteousness does not reach us. We look for light but all is darkness for brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Notice that we walk in deep shadows. Uh, like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if we were, if it was twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. We are, we all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none for deliverance, but it is far away. Oh my goodness, I can, I can just, just feel the lament of Isaiah. He made the list, and then Isaiah grieves for his people and his nation. He is not sugarcoating the situation. He does not move directly to predict better days ahead. He does not appeal to the nation to come together as one. Not yet. He does not plan or, or strategize. He does not call on people to rise up in protest. He does not organize any, any marches or he doesn't start any petitions. Isaiah stops and grieves. Let me tell you, there's honesty, there's humility and truth in this approach. And I think it's a good place to start us also. I think it's a good place for us as well. Maybe Isaiah's words can be helpful to you to grieve. So let me suggest the second practical action. After you make that list, let me suggest to use Isaiah's words to express lament for our nation's situation at this time. Maybe it's not just the nation. Maybe it's your family and friends. Uh, maybe it's a work situation or, or something else happening in your life. Use Isaiah's words and grieve well. Use verses 9, 10, and 11 and read them. Now, don't read them just to, just to know what it says. Read them so that they transform you. Use Isaiah's words to, to express yourself. Use Isaiah's words to grieve properly. See, proper grieving is important because without it, we cannot move to the next step. And here's the next step. 
Agreement with God's assessment of the situation. Agreement with God's assessment of the situation. In this case, repentance. Repentance. Listen to verse 12. For our offenses are many in your sight. Notice he said our. And our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us. And we acknowledge our iniquities. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord. Turning our backs to our God. Inciting revolt and oppression. Uttering lies our hearts have conceived. Notice how Isaiah puts himself right in the middle of that, even though Isaiah is probably not the one doing it, right? So justice, verse 14, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Oh, oh boy. Listen, here's what's happening. Isaiah agrees Isaiah agrees with God's assessment of the nation and repents. Now, let me tell you, repentance is not only agreement with God. It is also turning away from continue, continuing down the wrong way. It's like when you take a wrong turn while driving and the GPS is redirecting you, redirecting you back to the right course. That turning away from the wrong direction is repentance. Isaiah is doing that for the nation. And again, it's fascinating to me that he uses, he uses inclusive language, we and our, rather than they and those people, those that do evil, it's them. As far as I know, as far as we know, Isaiah was not the one who incited revolt, oppressed people, brought false testimony, or engaged in treachery. But here he is interceding for the nation and including himself with everyone. I can just see Isaiah broken because of that list, feeling the weight of that list. Uh, crying and, and lamenting and grieving passionately because of it, and then agreeing with God and repenting. Perhaps that is a model that we can benefit from, right? Perhaps this benefits us, right? Verse 15 totally resonated with me. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes prey. <laughs> what is fake news? What is real? And there's so many examples, my friends, you probably know of many examples of Christian leaders trying to guide people towards God only to become prey to scathing comments on social media. So I'd like to suggest a third practical action. Here's the third practical action. Let your prayers of intercession for our nation include repentance using the we and us language, not just they and them. Let me tell you, I've tried it. And I found it to be one of the hardest things that I've ever done. It's, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> I mean, why should I include we? I, I didn't do that. I found it to be harder than it sounds. But let me tell you, stick with it. Isaiah did. Isaiah did. And, and it gets actually easier with practice. It got easier with practice for me because as interceding for the nation, using the we language, I was able to make it easier because that's what practice does. does. And by the way, speaking of practice, let me, let me just encourage you to participate in practice in, in our Agape practice groups. It, we meet virtually every Thursday evenings uh, at Central Time, 6.45, 6.45, Thursday evening, Central Time. It's 60 minutes well spent, and I cannot overemphasize how beneficial it, it is. Listen, invest in your faith. Invest in your faith, especially as we are navigating a tough times like this. This Thursday, the group will explore, explore Genesis chapter 22, and Chris uh, will facilitate the group. I'm so excited that Chris is doing this. Listen, please make the time. Make the time. Invest the time, okay? 
All right, so this is that's a little that's a little of the APG advertisement, right? APG advertisement, APG Agape Practice Group. Yeah, <laughs> I guess we love our acronyms at Agape, don't we? We have AOK and APG. Well, anyway, all right. So let me get back to Isaiah 59. Okay, in Isaiah 59, we covered so far the the isolation that results from sin, uh, the list of sins, the lament that we should have towards those sins, and then the repentance. All these that we just covered, all these bring us face to face with a very difficult situation. One that has no easy solutions, okay? As a matter of fact, verse 16 says, no one could intervene. In other words, from our perspective, the situation of, of the list and the lament and, and this repentance, the situation is hopeless, absolutely hopeless. But thank God that God intervened. Thank God that God intervened. Here's what verses 15 and 16 say. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw, he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Now remember the situation that, that we're facing in this text, right? Remember the situation, the nation of Israel was cut off and had no idea what God was or was not doing. They asked questions like, well, where's God? Why does God not do something? Well, but God was not blind to their situations, right? And, and he knew that no one else could intervene. So he did. Did the nation of Israel even realize what God was doing? Maybe. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, unless they listened to what God's messenger said. That's Isaiah. Now, if they did listen they had to decide whether to believe him or not. Was Isaiah bringing them fake news or was Isaiah for real? See, I find a lot of applicable lessons for us for, for today. Where is God at a time like this? And I believe God is on the move, just like Isaiah prophetic poetry says. Okay? I believe God is on the move right now. And here's what verse 17 says. God put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine these pictures of, of a warrior getting ready for battle? <laughs> That's really what Isaiah is communicating in verse 18, uh, in verse 17. Now, here's what verse 18 says. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands there. Do remember the islands is an image of all the other nations, false gods, false religions. Uh, verse 19, from the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising sun, they will revere his glory for he will come like a pent up flood that had that uh, uh, that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Wow. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. The main idea, I won't have time to get into all the details, but let me tell you the main idea. The main idea is that God's justice will prevail. This is not the fake justice or the, uh, the, the, the justice without integrity. This is, this is the real justice will prevail over all those who rebel against him and led humanity into self-destruction. Even when we are caught off, even when we are caught off and we don't see God's face and hear his, his word, we can be assured that he is on the move to accomplish his plan of redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. Listen to verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, who's them that that the people of God, says the Lord. Okay, My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be in your lips and the lips of your children and the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. And that's the chapter. Now, listen, in spite of the sin that separates us, God never leaves his people. 
God never leaves his people. I believe this holds true today. God never leaves his people regardless of the circumstances they face, which means that God never leaves you and I. So let's put it all together, okay? Let's put it all together. Where is God at a time like this, in a time of trouble? Where? What's our takeaway from Isaiah 59? Well, first of all, God is God. He has not disappeared. Then what's happening? If he has not disappeared, what's happening? It's our sin. Our sin barricades us from seeing really God's face and hearing what he says. Isaiah made a list of sins. I think we should too. As we experience the weight of our sin, we can either remain there and be crushed by it, or it can move. In what direction should we move? Well, the first step is towards sorrow, towards lament, towards grieving. So does that mean that we jump from the pot into the fire? I was about to be crushed by sins, but now I'm, it's better because I'm sad. Well, no, 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 not exactly. Grieving our sins, both individually and corporate sins, allows us to, to shine the truth of God to difficult situations. It allows us to be honest and humble before God. Because the second step is aligning with God's assessment of what's happening. This alignment is called repentance. We turn away from going the wrong direction and get back on course. And the third step, as I mentioned, the third step is really not ours. There's, the third step is not you and I. It's what God does and has been doing all along. God has been and continues to be on a mission to redeem humanity, to reconcile people to himself, to restore their place as children of God. Redemption, reconciliation, restoration. The scripture says that this, that this was God's plan all along. So, so technically, <laughs> technically, it's the first step. It's the first step is what God does first, which means that the question is, where is God at a time like this is better understood in light of the weight of sin, grieving sin, and turning away from sin. Therefore, my friends, when we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot see God's face or hear his word because of our transgression, the practical steps to take are we name the sins. That's what we do when we make the list. We name the sins. We, we, we come face to face with them. We grieve the sins. That's when we, we pray fervently uh, prayers of intercession. Then we repent of sins. That's where we turn away and move in the right direction. And then number four, we follow God's message already given to his prophets. We, we call that the scriptures. All of the scriptures. At Agape, we review God's message every Sunday morning. That's what I'm doing right now, right? That's why I encourage you to never miss a Sunday morning. Why? Because we review God's message every Sunday morning. And then we amplify it in our lives through the either the AOKs, the Acts of Kindness, or the APGs, Agape Practice Groups. See, the Acts of Kindness and Agape Practice Groups are ways for us to amplify our faith. See, it all fits together. It all fits together for a time like this. You are all part of God's people for a time like this. <clears throat> so I'm encouraging you to take these steps and be God's image to those around you. Those who are wondering, where is God at a time like this? You show them. Let's show them together. Let's be agape, selfless love. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for where you've put us now. Thank you for the fact that you have empowered us. Thank you for the fact that while the list of sins is long and while the weight of sin is crushing, help us to grieve those sins well. Help us to turn away from these sins. And Father, help us to, to honor you by, by, by following and doing what you are doing. Help us to, to uh, amplify your your movement in our area, what you are doing. Help us to be good representatives. Help us to be good imagers of who you are. Father, we long to be your children and to be and to, to hold that, uh, that position well, that status well. Give us humility. Give us honesty. Give us courage. 
and help us to have an open mind to see you and to really, really follow you with guts. And Holy Spirit, help us to do that because we can't do it on our own. Help us and be with us as you promised. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.